do it. Yeah, we good to go? Always good to go. Yeah. I'm just chilling at Canada Life Center. That's the hard hitting analysis you listen to the Level Flight podcast for. Here we go. <clears throat> Jets are a brisket team, low and slow for the first two periods. And boom, an explosion of flavor in the last few minutes of the third. Ah, doing all right. Uh, better if my internet would work. Hello. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Elliot. This is this is comedy. Um, I'm Brian. I'm joined by Connor. Hello. And Elliot. Hey, hey. Wow, that was fun. You're listening to the Level Flight Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome into episode 96 of the Level Flight Podcast. My name is Connor. I'm joined by Elliot today. Brian was unable to make it. But we're going to talk about Scott Arneal. We talked about the hiring on Sunday's uh, LFP Live. If you joined us, thank you very much. Um, And today, we're going to talk about his presser, which he had Monday. Kind of our takeaways, his first time talking to the media since being hired as head coach of the team. Um, But before we get into that, Elliot, how are you doing? Good, good. It's been a little bit of a quiet week so far, other than in terms of Jets news. So just trying to gear for the weekend. It's going to be a crazy one. Yeah, there's outside of like the NHL conference final series, like heating up going into the weekend. There's a lot of Winnipeg summer sports. I know there's a Bomber game, a Seabears game. Lots to be excited about uh, here in Winnipeg. But let's start with this presser. Uh, Scott O'Neill was joined by Kevin Shovel Day Off. They officially announced him. They did the whole handshake uh, photo op thing uh, with the Arneal 24 jersey. You know, the, the whole thing. Um, what were your initial takeaways from the presser? We can get into like what he emphasized and what we liked and what we didn't like. Um, but it seemed positive from the the um, the response that I saw on Twitter from fans and what other people thought of it. So what were your initial takeaways when you saw the quotes or, or listened to the interview itself? I think my biggest takeaway was his emphasis on playing younger players. I think that was really the thing that kind of caught me. Okay, there is something here about we want to win, but his emphasis on you need young players on, he didn't say it, but on cheaper contracts to um, to help out a team and to make sure that you can kind of fit everybody else under the cap and be as good as you possibly can. I think that was my biggest takeaway because that's where the Jets currently are in terms of their roster construction. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a big thing that didn't, I know that it was two years ago, but Rick bonus was very much about let's fix the culture. Let's, you know, let's get this team back to winning and like, we're going to do whatever we have to do to win games. There was really not much about, the young guys and that was kind of when the youth movement kind of felt like it was really starting to go Mm -hmm. so to me it's good that there's an awareness there i was hoping that he wasn't just gonna say yeah we're gonna try to win hockey games and win playoff games okay well (laughs) that's great but you have this young way of players coming you need to figure out how you're going to kind of transition into that and how are you going to leverage that to try to win games um, I think that plus cool. the analytics talk, which we can get into, I think yeah. that was also big. And his comment about, I believe it was you that actually put it out there that he said, we want to look at analytics, not just when we're losing games or when things go bad, we need to yeah. leverage it and figure out what's working for us to continue to progress as an organization. Yeah. I loved that quote. Um, that That's why I put it out there. Like he said, it's easy to take your analytics um, when you're bad and say, okay, you're terrible at this and you're terrible at that. But what we want to do is press on kind of the things we're good at and find trends around the league uh, and kind of play copycat. And you know what? Every professional sports league is a copycat league. So if that's yeah. the plan, I'm on board. <laughs> yep. But back to the the youth thing. Um, that was really interesting to me as well because he started out the quote by saying, yeah, they're vital, especially in today's day and age with the salary cap. And what he didn't say is, yeah, you're the Winnipeg Jets. You're the smallest market in the league. It's even more vital when you're the smallest market in the league to have players on ELCs, drafted and developed players uh, contributing up and down your lineup. Um, And then he went out to say, like, well, we also need to make sure they're ready for the opportunity and things like that. Um, So, I don't know. A lot of the players that are young players and coming in next year are going to be ready for the opportunity, I think. Like Cole Perfetti. Uh, he said on the Jeff Merrick show, or Neil did actually, that 
yeah, he needs to play top six minutes. Um, so that's that's a good sign, I guess. Billy Hanela will be with the Jets. Yeah, Billy Hanela will be with the Jets next year unless they want to lose him to waivers or or move him um, as an RFA. He might get playing time on that bottom pairing as well, be in the mix for the six seven role. Um, and I think that that's that's a really good sign. Is that the young players comment? Obviously, it's May 29th. It's a little bit early to be like, all right, all the young players are going to play and everyone's going to be developed perfectly. Um, so we'll wait and see on that. But this was much like everything else in this presser. He said the right things. Um, and he said the right things about kind of making sure young players are ready and then expressing how important they are, especially when you're the Jets. But he didn't mention that part, but how important they are in general. Um, let's talk about the analytics thing. Um, he said they're going to have like a summer summit with like the players and the organization about analytics and how they want to you know, use them going forward. And he he put an emphasis on like making it presentable to the players, which I think is the most important. That's the smartest thing for them to do. I think that's the most important aspect to this because you you remember that article uh, that was written after the Jets Av series. It was Jack Johnson who was like, yeah, we had our analytics staff like come in and show us where the Jets weaknesses are. And we really pressed on those and things like that. Like, that's a team and an organization and an analytics department making it presentable to the players and telling them, Hey, the jets really suck at this. You should, you should really attack that. And then the abs go in and they put up 12 goals in the first games. They're like, huh, maybe, maybe they are. Maybe our analytics department does know something. You can't just walk up to Mark Schaefer and be like, Hey man, uh, your, your goals against per 60 is terrible fix it like you can't you can't just do that right yeah. you gotta make it presentable you gotta make make it um a tangible thing that he can improve on or whatever the case may be and i think that's the most important part of the analytics comment i don't know yeah. what let's talk about the analytics thing but i don't know what you thought about that comment in particular and everything he said about everything he it's yeah. just to go off of everything he said one one yeah. other thing that kind of caught my attention was when he was talking about the analytics he kind of made a comment about we want to be ahead of the curve, which yeah. to me, I was kind of like, you're almost behind the curve because you guys <laughs> yeah. are one of the last teams to be doing this. I'm glad you are, but they've had I an think... analytics department. They just, oh, yeah, they've never been this outspoken about like using it or presenting it to the players or having a summer summit yes. or whatever. That's, that's where that, I just wanted to add context to that. Like they've no, had no, a for sure. department for yeah five or more years now. Chevy said that, but this is new. So, well, yeah, that's all I'm trying to say is his right. comment of they're trying to get ahead of the curve. I'm a little like, okay, well, you have a department, but you haven't really been like outspoken uh, about it and said that you're it, trying yeah. to use it. So I'm trying to, I'm just trying to say there are other teams that are very outspoken about. It, so you're not really ahead of the curve on that. Um, yeah. Mainly what I'm interested to see what happens here is I don't know if they really dive in deep into the analytics. I don't know if they're really going to like where their team sits, at least in terms of a lot of the players on their team are yeah. not very like, like, I don't know. To me, there are lots of guys on that team that you look at their analytics and you go, Oh God, this is very old school. Like we're not going to like pay attention to the analytics. We're going to play a more old school style. Like this team mm -hmm. is very like built around an old school feel. So if Scott O'Neill wants to reject this team with a lot more analytics and looking at guys and seeing how they fit that way. Great. That's fantastic. But that's going to require the jets to make a lot of changes in on their roster. Like th that means that there's going to have to be wholesale changes to specific players and lines and that sort of thing. Like, I don't know. You, you you would have to you'd have to look at everything because to me it's just kind of like it it's a good thing, but yeah. I think there's gonna have to be lots of change because yeah I yeah I don't know. I mean it, it, it's a good direction, but you look at a lot like Pionk isn't very good analytically. Um, you look at Brendan Dillon wasn't very good analytically, and I know those two were right. together, so it's kind of hard. That third line towards the end of the season, like. I don't know. Adam Lowry, yes, was in conversation for Selkie voting, but like his analytics aren't great. Like a guy like yeah. Mino Meter Writers is. Um, Mason Appleton's for sure isn't. Lowry's, Velarde's is on like Lowry's, Lowry's for funny. sure, but 
Lowry's funny because his career, like analytical chart. Oh yeah. Is like he peaked at 24 and then his line mates for the next three seasons were like, I don't know, Saku Manalainen and Zach Sanford. Yeah. And then, so he dipped big time and now he's all the way back up. And I think that's why he got Selkie votes is that, that third line over the 82 game sample was fantastic. And I think that's why Rick bonus kept going back to them and didn't put an Alex. I follow up there or, or Morgan Barron or whatever the case may be. Um, but I think the biggest things here is if you dive into the analytics, um, I don't know, Connor and Shifley, uh, the analytics say that they've never really worked together. Neil Pionk, like you said, top four minutes, uh, played over 20 or like roughly 20 minutes a night last year. His analytics aren't very good. Um, and then there's the the conversation of Nikolai Ehlers. And someone, I wish I could credit it, but someone made a joke. It was like um, the Jets after trading Ehlers at their analytical summer summit. And it was like someone with their hands on their head. Yeah, yeah. It was like, yeah. That was one of my <laughs> big things that I was thinking about. I was going to bring up Ehlers. It's like, yeah. if you dive deep, if you've been shopping Ehlers and you want to talk analytics, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> yeah, right, it, there yeah. Should, it should be immediately somebody picks up, like it should be someone would call the Jets being like, hey, I heard you're shopping Ehlers still. It, Kevin Cheveldayoff after that summit would be like, we are no longer shopping Nikolai Ehlers. He is now untouchable, right? Yeah, if yeah. you're going all in on analytics, then you cannot trade Nikolai Ehlers. Unless you're going to trade him for somebody else that fits more the style you're trying to do, but also is good analytically, which right. there's not very many guys like that in the league. So and again, I don't know. Again, they're not looking at like J Fresh cards and being like, yeah. oh my God, Nikolai Ehlers is amazing. But like there are actual <laughs> analytics that NHL teams track that would yeah. still s- tell the same story. Yeah. Um, so us looking at a JFresh card and be like, oh, Ehlers is good analytically. Like, no, that's not what they're going to do at the Summer Summit. They're not going to roll through everyone's JFresh card. But they are going to look <laughs> at like zone. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to look at like zone entries and like high danger yeah. chance assists and like things that NHL teams track. That's yeah. that's I still think um, this is a good thing. This is a good direction. Oh, but yes. it all matters. It all it, and it's a long time coming, like you said, like what took so long you're trying to get it at ahead of the curve but in reality you're behind it um but at the end of the day it's how they use it it's how they present it to the players that'll be the most important thing that much was something like the i young... wanted to talk about too yeah is like much, how you much present like... it like yeah like you said it's huge how they present it because if you don't present it correctly to a player to make it tangible then it's useless like you need to tell and, uh, mark shifley hey your xg goals four per 60 is low but it's high, higher in these areas. So try to get, like, you have to make it tangible for a right. player to say, you need to get to these areas more, or you need to shoot the puck from here more, or, hey, when you're in this situation, you need to make this play instead. Like, they need to do it that way, and not just, like you said, say, this is bad, fix it. Okay, yeah. well, show me, like, I would hope a player would go, okay, well, show me a chart. Like, I need to see this, and then... You also need to then tell a player, and this is getting way ahead of a curve. You need to tell a player where to get to. Then you also need to tell them, okay, how do you fix this part and also make it something that you can go back to when teams shut this part of your game down, right? Yeah, yeah. And that'll all be a part of the incorporation of, of, of the summit. Yeah, um, and it'll be something that I know Murata Tesh is going to ask about a lot yeah. over the course of the summer and into next season and things of that nature. And it's something I'm very curious about how they present it to the players and how the players handle it. Like asking the players themselves, okay, what, what was the summit like for you? If, if there was this big meeting, what, how in tune are you with, with the analytical side of hockey? It's, it's going to be really interesting, but much like the young players comment with the analytics comment, I think Scott O'Neill said all the right things. And I, I really, there was a lot more faith in Scott O'Neill after the presser than before. And I think that's that's a really good start to yeah. his tenure as head coach. Honestly, if if because there was a lot of people that was like, oh, really? Like ro- rolled their eyes. Yeah, new voice, but not really a new voice. Um, played with the Jets, of course he did. Of course he has organizational ties. But then you you listen to what he had to say, and I think it was uh, it was it was good. Was there anything else from the presser besides the analytics and the youth that you really really caught your attention? Not, not really, but like you said, I think this is. It is technically technically a new direction. You look at Rick Bonus; yeah. he was coming in to fix the culture, but he was the same. He was a little bit more of a players' coach than Paul Maurice, 
but he yeah. still had a same style of play, right? There, it really wasn't a, a new voice. It was more so like, hey, let's get somebody that's similar, but not too much different. I think here, as much as Scott O'Neill is somewhat of not a new voice, I think his style of play will be a new voice in a sense for the Jets to maybe put them on a different a, a different path, but maybe a better path, especially with the players that they have coming up. And I think the players that they have drafted kind of more so fit what they're trying to do with this quote unquote new vision if they're going to follow it. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the decisions they make on UFAs will also shape how they play next year. And I think Scott O'Neill knows that. Um, and that, that'll be really interesting to follow. The last thing I want to say that impressed me uh, is the questions about how he's like grown and learned from his experience as a head coach before in Columbus. And basically his response every time was like, you come in as a young coach, you think you have all the answers. Um, but in reality, you don't, we were a young coaching staff and all these things. And I think that really impressed me. He said he's grown as a person and a coach. Uh, and he's learned from some of the best coaching staffs since that point, obviously with Rick bonus as well. And he's learned, he brought up Rick's like reaching out to the players and being a player's coach. And that's something that he's learned as well. Um, I think that really impressed me kind of the growth aspect, because we all know his tenure in Columbus was short and it wasn't great. Um, and his, his character has been questioned, let's just say, um, online since, since that, um, and him saying like, yeah, you come in young, arrogant, you think you have all the answers and in reality you don't. And him growing from that, I think it is a really Big. good sign. Um, really good sign. Yeah. We're going to go to break. Um, you're going to hear a word from DraftKings. And then when we come back, we are going to talk about the NHL conference finals. Um, Florida tied it up 2-2 last night. Lots to talk about. Stick with us on episode 96 of the Low Flight Podcast. We're this close to crowning the Stanley Cup champion, and with the action heating up on the ice, it's even hotter at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NHL. New to DraftKings? Listen up. New customers can get a no-sweat bet up to 1500 bucks. Just deposit at least 5 bucks, and you'll get a bonus bet back equal to your first bet if it doesn't hit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code THPN. That's code THPN for new customers to get a no-sweat bet up to 1500 bucks if your first bet doesn't hit. Only on DraftKings, the crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, licensee partner Golden Nugget Lake Charles. 21 plus, age varies by jurisdiction, void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash hockey for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Copyright NHL 2024, all rights reserved. And welcome back into episode 96 of the Level Flight Podcast. Thank you for joining us. If you can, follow us on all socials at Level Flight WPG. The next you'll hear from us is Sunday. LFP Live, 9 a.m. on YouTube. We're there every Sunday. Um, but let's talk about these NHL Conference Finals. Elliot, last night, Sam Reinhart scored in overtime. Florida tied the series up. Um, Igor Shesterkin did all he could, but it was just too much because he made, like, grade A save after grade A save, and Florida somehow set, had to go to overtime to win it. It was unbelievable. But anyways, um, Dallas is up 2-1. They play again tonight. When you're hearing this, that game will have happened. Um, so either Dallas is up 3-1 or Edmonton even the series at 2-2. Um, but the other series is at 2-2. What have you seen from these series? Maybe start with Florida, New York, um, as it's all evened up going back to New York on Thursday night. Well, we were talking about a while back about, how, well, I wonder how this series is going to go and what kind of direction is it going to be? It's been a slug. Like, it's just been physical, but fast, yeah. goaltending duel. Like, it's been it's, it's been all Florida, too, if we're being honest. Oh, like, yeah, it's been all Florida Igor, for sure. Kevin Bieksa on the on the Sportsnet panel said after the game, he was like, at some point here, New York is going to have to outplay their opponent because they haven't in, like, 10 straight games. Like, even going back to the Carolina series. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, Igor was stealing them games. And all four games of the series – the I, I think maybe the OT game at home where they won two one maybe they that one was a little close um but man they they've gotten outplayed in 
basically every game, I think. Yeah. And Igor's just been unreal. But Kevin Bieksa, great take. Because at some point, if you're going to win the Stanley Cup, you got to outplay your opponent. Like, it's, you can't just rely on your goalie. Well, sometimes you can, but, like, you're going to have mean, to outplay them at some point. We do do a podcast about an organization that relies on their goaltender to literally <laughs> carry <laughs> them into the playoffs. But Good anyway... Point. <laughs> so yeah no ego, it, it's just been so fun i've yeah. enjoyed the i actually if i'm being quite honest i've enjoyed this like the florida new york series i've enjoyed but i've almost enjoyed as much the edmonton dallas series i don't know i said before there was going to be a snooze fest i don't know how it's it has not been a snooze fest like yeah it's it's been pretty both of the both series have been so close so I don't know. I yeah, you're right. The Rangers got to wake up at some point. You you have to. Yeah. You as a team have to win a game at some point. Because if you don't, yeah. then a game like last night is just going to keep happening. But in regulation, like Florida's then just going to win three one, and you will never look like it, it'll look like you were in it because Shesterkin keeps the game at two to one for twenty five, yeah. like for the end of the second period, all the way into the third, and then you give up an empty netter late. But like. Yeah. You, you can't you can't you have to somebody has to wake up at some point and you also can't wake up late in the third period to tie the game every time like you, you can't yeah. you can't, can't rely on that. tying it late yeah <laughs> i mean it's really just the igor shesterkin and the alexi lafreniere show for new york right now and honestly it's kind of fun to watch like yes they need to i i totally agree they need to outplay them as a team at some point but watching Igor make like 50 saves and then Lafreniere having two goals every single night is just hilarious. And, and, and it's working. It's somehow, you know, it's like also somehow tied. Yeah. It's also hilarious when you bring up Alexi Lafreniere that I remember his rookie season, everyone calling him like the worst number one overall draft pick in the last, it's like, yeah. Cause he like, comes in doing? at what? 19 years old or 18 years old on a team that's loaded in the top six. So he plays bottom six minutes and struggles like okay yeah <laughs> yeah can, oh NHL. yeah he's yeah. bad when he's making fantastic <laughs> play like he you see the uh the oh, vision man. as a so as a good. playmaker and oh you know what i guess we also should mention um shout out blake wheeler for yes return making the a return. <laughs> he took a well it wasn't really his fault i think he just kind of saved the goal but he took the penalty in overtime which then the panthers scored the ot winner on um, but again, like, I don't think it wasn't him ball. that turned, <laughs> it wasn't him that turned it over. Uh, and he basically stopped a breakaway from happening. So I think it was a good penalty in the end. Um, but I mean, yeah, I, I was just going to say the Rangers should have been a penalty win. shot. Should have been yeah. a penalty shot. It was a it clear cut breakaway. I don't know how that was. Well, but I think the refs didn't want the game to end on a penalty shot. Hey, I did. Just like the CEBL. <laughs> Do you want the game right. to end on a free throw? I don't know. But I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and anyway, but, yeah. um, I don't it, the Rangers record with Blake Wheeler in the lineup's not pretty. So when I saw him in the lineup, I was kind of like, well, they've lost this game. But yeah, I don't know. Like, I saw a lot of people when he was nearing a return. A lot of Rangers fans were like, he's not even one of our 12 best forwards. Like, he shouldn't come back, let alone after months of rehabbing an injury. And I don't know. The speed of the series is so fast. Like I just, I just don't think he should even be in the lineup. I don't even know no. who their replacement, who they took out. But anyway, uh, well, I know Philip Heedle. I think was also. Oh, he was hurt. I think right? he was kind of a maybe because yeah. they had yeah. like three forwards in warm up ready to go, and Heedle was out there, but he was a game time decision. So I don't right. know. Right. Right. But- okay. Yeah. And then the other series, Jason Robertson. Welcome to the series. R- Rupe Hints is back, and with that, Jason Robertson like mm-hmm. who is his winger kind of woke up as well scoring his first goal since i think it was game five against vegas it was an 11 first game goal. goalless drought oh wow yeah okay yeah yeah well that checks out yeah there you go hat trick <laughs> hat trick that uh, third in- one man Stuart oh, skinner goodness. buddy Stu- stewie skins <laughs> cover your post <laughs> what are you doing yeah and oh man it's it's goaltending in defense like it's it's the edmonton oilers tail old this time like it's gonna it's gonna burn them like it always does um but i i i don't know the oilers have done better in this series than i thought they yeah. would like i think they should have won game two and game three given how well they played in both those games game three they laid down for an entire period and when you do that in the playoffs 
you're not really going to win. Uh, but game two, I thought they played great. Game three, outside of the second period, I thought they played great. Uh, and I think they're right there. I It's tough to predict because it's tonight and you'll be hearing this episode tomorrow. Yeah. So you already, already happened. Know. But I, I will I, I will say I don't know if you're on yeah. your phone, but there was a obviously this is will be again with us posting this tomorrow. Um, yeah. This will already been no, news and we we'll already know what this is about. But Elliot Freeman tweeted out that Chris Knobloch said there will be lineup changes, but apparently with a smile on his face, um, we're gonna have to wait for the quote unquote showcase tonight. So I don't know what that means. Is that Philip Broberg? Maybe. And they're like Maybe. showcasing a former first round pick. I don't know. Like, like what, what is that? Like Chris, like you need to at least give us some <laughs> sort of like, Oh, it's the playoffs. No, it, no, he's it's not, a he's showcase. Not a like what, what, yeah. what are we doing? Like, it's not like you had like the here, showcase is going to be like inserting Derek Ryan onto the fourth line. <laughs> like, I don't know. Well, no, it's, it's more like, here's my thing. The showcase for Dallas was putting Rupe hints back in the lineup. Like that, that to me would be like right. a showcase where it's like, Oh, there's a player nearing a return, but we don't actually know if he's close or not. And right. then, like, if Dallas, had, like, if Peter DeBoer had done the same thing and been like, "Oh, we don't know when Rupe is coming back," but hey, you know what? We're doing lineup changes tonight, so be ready for the showcase. And Rupe hints is in the lineup, right? right? Where it's like, "Oh, surprise! Like, he's back." You know what I mean? Man. Like, the, the, the Oilers, know. like McDavid, Drysital, Nugent Hopkins, Hyman, Bouchard, and Ekholm are already all playing. It's not like yeah. one of them were injured, and it's yeah. like. Hey, welcome back to the series X, like X factor type player. So yeah. I don't know what they're like. I don't know either. <laughs> it's, it's Corey Perry, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, coming back in. Ooh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I don't think it matters either. I don't. I don't either. I don't think they scratch Darnell Nurse. He's had one of the most minus playoff runs I've seen for a nine million dollar defenseman that I've ever seen. Um, but I don't think. I don't think he's uh, he's gonna get scratched. I mean, that would be kind of wild if they scratched him. Is it a showcase? But, I don't know if that's a showcase. Well, if you scratch Nurse for Broberg, <laughs> does your team get better? I don't know. Like, man, Nurse. I think a pylon better. might be better than Darnell Nurse right now. <laughs> Nurse has just been like a detriment to the lineup. But regardless, yeah. the, the defense and the goaltending has to pick it up, and that's again. Skinner's we've been, been good that enough. Good enough. Like... That goal was tough. Yeah, they the the team laid down for an entire period. Like that's not his fault either. Um, I still think the Oilers have a really good shot in the series. I think it goes the distance. Um, and I think you know I'm gonna say it. I think they win tonight on home ice, even up the series. Um, I'm hoping they win this series in general. You don't like it. You don't like it. You like the stars. I think make star, ourselves I, look it, dumb with this pick because <laughs> it will already happen. I think stars in five or six. But mm, okay, well, so you we'll like see. stars. I, I like the stars. To, I like the stars tonight. I think if Edmonton's going to win, it's a game five. Because here, here's my other thing, just quickly. In game three, Connor McDavid looked like he was on a tear of like I'm. In we are up to. Period, he was, yeah, we are up to totally. nothing. I am not allowing us to win. Lose this game. Yeah. And then everybody just disappeared. So Every, if he's yeah. going to do that again, it's probably game five, and then they lose at home in game six Maybe. i don't know yeah i think a ranger stars series would be the most fun because it's the two best teams in each conference true well subjectively I, um going at I it like the, so yeah yeah true i i like the i don't know i think my favorite matchup th there's not a bad matchup actually now no. that i think about it left they're all they're all amazing um if unless you have anything else let's let's get on out of here no i think we we're go. good i think good we're good to go Thanks for sticking around on episode 96. Uh, join us this Sunday, 9 a.m. LFP Live. We're there every single Sunday, um, at, right at 9 o'clock on YouTube. At, at 9 o'clock. Make sure you're there at, at 9 o'clock. At 9 o'clock. Uh, at Level Flight WPG on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. That's where you can find the LFP Live. Um, thank you for checking this out. We will see you Sunday. Enjoy the hockey games this week. Enjoy the Bomber game if you're going Friday, Sea Bears game if you're going Saturday. Um, and we will see you on Sunday. Have a great couple days, everyone. See you. Peace.